All right. Well, I'm, I'm almost finished with the elders. I'm, I'm gonna leave them alone in, in a couple of weeks. But uh, we, got, we, have a, we have a little bit more to go over with them. And uh, hopefully they're being encouraged and challenged at the same time. Let's get ready for our Bible study. Uh, we're gonna be uh, continuing our study in the book of Titus tonight. Titus. And we are <clears throat> in Paul's salutation. Titus chapter 1. Let's, let's bow in a word of prayer as we prepare ourselves for our study this evening. Heavenly Father, we are thankful to be here tonight uh, to spend time in your word. We're thankful that we're able to do that. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would bless our time, <clears throat> that you would encourage and strengthen us in the grace of Christ. Help us to learn what your word is saying, and then help us, Lord God, to seek to live in light of it, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Paul's salutation. Paul's salutation. I guess we should read the salutation, should we not? Titus chapter 1, uh, and the salutation is verses 1 through 4. Paul, a bondservant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ to the faith, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness in the hope of eternal life which God who cannot lie promised long ages ago but at the proper time manif manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I was entrusted according to the commandment of God our Savior to Titus my true child in a common faith grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior and so in the salutation, Paul has been laying out <clears throat> really his ministry. Now, kind of think back, <clears throat> think back to when we first started looking at Titus. We established that the book of the in the book of Titus. Paul's salutation was unique. His salutation was unique. Do you remember why it was unique? I don't know if you do, but it's been a little bit while since we looked at this. But the, the uniqueness of this salutation rested in two, in two areas. First off, it was the second longest of all his salutations in any of his letters. Now, that's particularly striking uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, it's not a long letter. It's not a long letter. It's a, it's a short letter, especially when you think of the, the longest salutation is found in, in Romans, and w Romans dwarfs this book in size. But this, this salutation in Titus is longer than a number of books that are way longer than Titus, but it, it's longer. So, so the size of the book and the size of the salutation don't seem to match, and we, we, we went through all the different salutations, looked at how long they were, and this one is very, very long. The other thing about this salutation that makes it unique is that Paul was introducing himself to somebody who already knew him very well. I mean, Titus, Titus ministered next to Paul. And so you have to wonder, well, why is it that, Paul, that Titus would need to be introduced to Paul? And Paul refers to him as his dear child. And so uh, he, he kind of... He kind of it seemed a little strange to us as we were trying to understand the book of Titus and uh, why Paul is writing this particular book. Why did he spend so much time explaining who he was to somebody who already knew him very well? Well, uh, I gave you a couple of suggestions as to why this might be the case. Why would Paul do this? One option, one possibility... <clears throat> was that because of the challenging nature of Titus's work on, on the island, what this meant was that there may be some people that would resist, that would resist Titus. In fact, in chapter 3, we're going to find out about a, Paul giving him instructions about a factious, how to deal with a factious man. But clearly, th this was a challenging ministry. And so we could see a point in which maybe his ministry would be challenged by those he was ministering to and being able to show this letter to those individuals from Paul might serve as a way of quelling some of the disagree disagreeableness or disagreeable behavior that might 
that might uh, define his ministry on the island of Crete. So, so uh, uh, this long introduction to who he was uh, could serve as a defense for, for Titus if he had to show the letter to individuals as he sought to implement the, the uh, ministry that Paul had left him on, Crite, on Crete to accomplish. Another possibility, uh, a second one that I gave you for the, such a lengthy salutation, could be that Titus himself was struggling with this task. Uh, we oftentimes kind of think of Titus as being more mature or, or stronger than Timothy was, for example, and, and that's a very possible, that's, a, that's a, a possibility, obviously. But maybe Titus was struggling a little bit with Titus's job. And so by beginning this, this letter in this way, Paul is reminding Titus, hey, uh, take, a, take, a bigger, take a bigger vision of, of what you're doing. Titus, what you're doing is part of a bigger mission, and, this is, and, my, and my bigger mission is, as I explain here in the salutation. So, so Paul's rehearsing of his bigger mission could, could help Titus to place his difficult mission in that context. Understand what you're doing on Crete in light of what God has called me to do in the, in, in, in the world. And so uh, while we're not sure exactly why uh, the, the uh, salutation was this length or, 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 or this involved, uh, we do know that it, it is very, very lengthy. And, and Paul opened up this letter by reminding Titus of his office. Paul, a bondservant of God and uh, as an apostle of Jesus Christ. And so the, the first part of this salutation, the A part is, is Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. And uh, he spends the most time on this, verse 1 through verse 3. He, he first, we saw this already, he reminded Titus, of two things, his status and his office. His status and his office. He was a bondservant. Really, if we're going to be, if we're going to properly translate this, he was a bond slave, or he was better yet a slave, just plain slave. He was a slave and an apostle. There we saw his, his office. A slave and an apostle. The slave dealt with his self-disclosure. That's, that's how we described this first point. His, his self-disclosure. He was, a, he was a slave. He was a slave. And then the second part, an apostle, that was his official capacity. And so we can, now, for the last two weeks, we've been, we've been looking at what an apostle was. And so we, we went into a deep dive into an apostle. And, uh, and I did this because we, we hadn't spent a, spent a long time on apostle. And there's a lot of people that they calling themselves, calling themselves an apostle. We concluded that the apostles was, were a closed group of men. They, there couldn't be any more apostles now because though the apostles had to have a very uh, particular set of observations. They had, to, they had to be able to witness Christ from his... Uh, from the from the baptism of John all the way to his resurrection, uh, Paul was unique in this regard. He was special, all right. He was one of a kind. But we also saw that they were apostles, not of Jesus Christ, but apostles of the church. And so we distinguished two types of apostles, didn't we? We have an apostle. of Jesus Christ that's the 12 plus plus 1 and then we had 
apostle of the church. And that's open-ended. The, uh, and the reason we say it's open-ended is because all the apostle was, was was a sent person. And so if if we as a church were to send Brother Don to do some ministry in South Carolina, we could call him our apostle. Right? He, 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 he has no special office, okay? All he's doing is he's being sent to do a duty, to do a job, all right? Now, of course, uh, people who use the word apostle nowadays, normally uh, they're, they're thinking they're, they're this guy. When in fact, at best, they're this guy, and maybe not even that. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, that's 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 neither he, neither here nor there. So, <clears throat> as we as we looked at that, we we uh, made some observations about who Paul was, and so now we prepare ourselves to move on to our second part. Paul reminded Titus of his status and his office. And now Paul reminded Titus of his mission. He reminded Titus of his mission. What we see here is that his mission could be looked at from two different vantage points. I read this already for you, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it again. Just kind of think about the mission of Paul and tell me what you see when I read this. The mission of Paul. What was the mission of Paul? Paul says, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in the hope of eternal life with which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested even his word in the proclamation with which I have been entrusted according to the commandment of God, our Savior. How would you describe the mission of Paul? What is, what is, he, what is he saying here that his mission was? A gospel mission, okay. Proclaiming the, the reality of you know, those who have been chosen and when they were chosen and who chose them and how long ago it was and, uh, you know, and the future uh, state that they look forward to. Okay. Okay. Any, anybody else? How else would you describe from those verses I read the mission of Paul? The mission of Paul. Okay, okay, so both of you, both of you, looking at it from a different angle, both of you kind of focus on his proclamation. <clears throat> and that clearly is, <clears throat> that clearly is a, is a major point here in this, in this passage, the, the proclamation end of things. Yeah. I don't know if anybody else has any other. Let me ask you something. Um, was Paul serving man, God, or both? Or why would you say both? Well, uh, of course, he, he's an apostle. He's mm-hmm. one sent, and he's sent for a purpose to to uh, serve the church on behalf of Jesus Christ. And so he's serving Christ, who sent him, and he's also serving the church in terms of how he he's here trying to uh, instruct them. So I think he's doing both. Doing both, okay. Anybody else have any? Ideas? I, I believe you're right. Um, <clears throat> what, we, what we see here 
is that there is a a manward a manward aspect to to Paul's mission and a godward aspect. I'm, yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh-huh. Yeah, I was going to say he's serving God because this church is here to serve God, so it's all to God's glory. He is serving God, so you don't you don't think he's serving men? No. Okay. I mean, he's serving men in the in the service of ministry, but this is all to God's glory. It's all it's all to serve God. It is all to serve God. I, I would I would argue though that he is serving man in the sense of he's ministering to men. He's ministering to men, and and, and, yeah. I, and, and, and I definitely see your point. He's doing that obviously to the glory of God, not to the glory of of men. But let me let me let me phrase this in in a way that might be helpful for you this evening. There is a there is a manward aspect of his ministry. There's a manward aspect of his ministry, and there is a Godward aspect to his ministry. Um, do you remember that? Um, particularly in the Old Testament, the, the the priests were often when they were doing their priestly duties in the in the uh, temple that they, they were described as serving God. Uh, and they were doing things in the, in the temple that had a Godward focus uh, to what they were doing. But at times, things that they did had a manward focus. Some of the duties of the priest required certain things that would take place within the context of the people of God itself. And so uh, I, let, me, let me kind of go through this, and I think that it'll become clear what, what, that when we talk about the manward aspect of Paul's service, we're not talking necessarily saying that he's serving men in a bad sense, but God has them in, God is using him in the service of men. He's using him in the service of men. And so <clears throat> I want to, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to divide Paul's service up here in the, in the, in the, in the two parts. First, the man word aspect of it. And this is in reference to the elect or the chosen, in reference to the chosen. He says, for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness. Here we see both the objects of Paul's ministry and the subjects of Paul's ministry. How would you describe the objects of his mission? He was ministering to the called. To the called? And those chosen of God. Or the, the chosen of God, yes. Yes. There we see the objects of his efforts. The objects of his efforts or his mission. Those chosen of God those chosen of God. This term chosen translates from the Greek word eklektos. What does that sound like? Eklektos. Elect, or it also sounds like what is this word? In English. No. Is that electric you have there? Yeah. What does that mean? Anybody, anybody remember? The English word eclectic? When, when, you, when you talk about something being a, a, an, an eclectic, what are you, what are you talking about? You're talking about the, you've, you've chosen things from various places and made it into one group, right? That's, that's an, so the word eclectic in English <clears throat> means to choose or select from a various group of sources, styles, or things. That's a very eclectic group of, of uh, shoes you have there. You have all different types of shoes. 
It's, very, it's, a, it's a very eclectic group of whatever. And so it's the idea of, 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 of choosing from, from a varied source. Now, the dominant New Testament usage of this idea is God choosing from the mass of humanity those that he will draw to Christ and save. So God, so God is selecting from all different types and he's bringing them to himself. Is he only choosing Jews? No. Is he only choosing females, but not males? Is he only choosing free men and not slaves? He's choosing from what? An eclectic group of people. All different types. All different types. Uh, this word is, uh, all, it's only used once, uh, it's used once in a rather unusual way to describe angels, angels as the elect. But the, the normal usage of this term is to, is to refer to humanity and refer to those that God has chosen for salvation. <clears throat> God has chosen from a diverse set of individuals, those who will come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's, it's clear from passages such as 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2, that election, being chosen, is a key part of the work of God in salvation. Without being chosen, you would never come to salvation. Listen, listen to Paul, sorry, listen to Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, Sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. <clears throat> Peter says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bethania, who are chosen. Then he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, that you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood. This is a passage we know well. I've gone over it so many times with you over the years. Let's just quickly review here. This, this choosing by God's foreknowledge, that is his predetermined will, in turn determines something else. So God's choosing determines something else. What, is it, what does it determine? Well, it determines those upon whom the work of the Holy Spirit that is necessary to accomplish salvation will be executed. Who does the Spirit work on? The Spirit works on for salvation, he works on those that God has foreknown. The foreknowledge leads to the Spirit's sanctifying, his separating of those chosen individuals to come to Christ. So the, the foreknowledge leads to the Spirit's work, and the Spirit's work leads to the Son, the Son's work, which is the sprinkling of his blood on those to whom God has chosen. What does the sprinkling of his blood do? It cleanses them, makes them clean. That's, that's salvation. That's salvation. And so here we see that election is the critical step in that phase. This is who they are. They're the elect, the chosen of God. And what does Paul, what does Paul concern himself with regarding the chosen? What are, the, what are the two things he mentions in this text? Faith and what? Knowledge. Right? Faith and knowledge. That's what he said. He said he's an apostle of Jesus Christ for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth. So two things Paul is concerned about, faith and knowledge. Now, let me ask you something. Is he concerned about the faith and knowledge of the elect before they're saved or after they're saved? Exercise faith, those who have been, know that they're chosen by exercising faith, I guess. So, I guess my, my question this evening is 
Can you be described as chosen before you're saved? No. So you weren't chosen. Well, yeah, you can, but you, <laughs> you, you don't know. Okay, you don't, you don't, you don't know, know whether you're chosen. chosen. Okay, yeah, I would person. agree with that. You, a, a person before they're saved doesn't know they're chosen, but that wasn't my question. My, 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 my question wasn't, can you know that you're chosen before you're saved? I said, can you be referred to as chosen before you're saved? I guess God can do that. I guess he knows. Are you chosen before you're saved? Yes. Absolutely you are. But God knows that. When, when were you chosen? Salvation. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will. So, in becoming adopted, what has to precede your adoption? Predestination. And what precedes predestination? Election. So, you can be referred to as the chosen even before you're converted. Now, you don't know that, right? As Brother Don said, I don't know whether I'm chosen or not b before salvation, but could Paul refer to people as chosen before they were saved? Some deep questions, right? You're saying, well, that's, that's too deep for Sunday night, Pastor. That's too deep. Well, let's, let's look at these, these two things. We looked at the sub, the objects. The, ob the objects are the chosen. Let's look at the subjects here the subjects of, Paul, of his mission. And Paul gives two subjects. Faith and knowledge. Faith and knowledge. Paul is concerned first with the faith of the elect. The faith of the elect. The faith of these elect was the first aspect of his, of, of his ministry that he identified. Faith here obviously is, broadly used, is a broadly used word in the Bible. It basically referred to what could be best represented as trust. 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 Uh, I've, given you, I've given you a very detailed definitions of faith in the past. Uh, one, I found one uh, d d definition of faith I gave you years ago, uh, and, I, and I defined it as that confident, reliant, expecting internal human action based on the nature, ability, or actions of a person or thing that determines or affects his response to that object. So it's, it's, a, it's a confident, reliant, expecting internal human action based on somebody else, on their nature, on their ability. And the effects of that response to that object. But a simple term, is, a simple way to define it is just, just trust, trust. Now, in considering the idea of trust or faith in the Bible, it's used in different ways. For example, it can refer to something being trustworthy. It can be something that's trustworthy. The, the focus when being used in this way is the, is the object of the trust, and when used in, in this fashion, it is translated faithful or faithfulness. Somebody who's trustworthy is faithful. They can be trusted. Uh, look with me at Romans chapter 3. Just want you to see some of the different ways that this is used in, in the Bible. Romans chapter 3. Verse 3. What then 
if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the faithfulness of God. Is our word, is the word faith. It's translated faithfulness here, will it? What does he mean by the, the faithfulness of God? He means the trustworthiness of God, right? What then, if, if some did not believe, their unbelief will not nullify the trustworthiness of God. And so this word faith can refer to the idea of, 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 of trustworthiness or, or that, that which in, engenders trust. And when it is, oftentimes, again, it's translated faith or faithful, a faithful or faithfulness. Another way that, that the idea of faith is used in the Bible <clears throat> is that faith may also refer to what we might describe as true Christianity. The, 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 whole, Christian, the whole Christian system is sometimes described by this word faith. faith. Now look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. Verse 8, I tell you that he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This, here it means the Christian, the Christian religion, the Christian truth, the Christian reality. Another way that faith is used in the New Testament is as a reference to the, the body of beliefs of Christianity, the, the, the doctrines of the Christian faith, uh, the Christian teaching, All right? Look at Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Just some different ways that we see the word, the idea of faith used in the Bible. Verse 7, and the word of God kept on spreading, and the number of the disciples continued to increase greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were becoming obedient to the faith. They were becoming obedient to the system, the body of belief, the truths that stand behind Christianity. And so the idea of faith can have a broad meaning here. How, how should we understand it in our text here this evening? How should, we, how should we take this word here? What is Paul referring to when he talks about that his ministry was focused on, as he says here, the faith of those chosen of God? What do you, what do you think Paul's emphasis here is? to the faith, so it could be saying that these uh, these believers to whom he wrote have exercised faith in the gospel of Christ. So one one idea here could be that the the exercising of faith in coming to Christ that that Paul ministers to see that happen. That, 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 that he, 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 he ministers in order to see the elect exercise faith. Hmm, it's one way to understand it. Some people argue that what Paul means here is this, the our last point, the system of, the system of, of truth. The system of Christianity, the the the, uh, the uh, doctrines that he labors, in order that the chosen would have the right doctrine. Which which one do you think fits this context? Well. I don't think that either is a, a bad interpretation. 
I, I, don't, I don't think either is wrong. I would tend to the first one that Don was advocating rather than the second one. Now, why do I think that Paul is not saying that he, he labors in order to help the chosen have the right understanding of the Christian faith? Well, I kind of think that's his point in the second half of the statement. And so the first, the first part of being elect is, is coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, that normally when you, see, when you see the idea of the faith, you don't expect to have a, a personal reference here. It's the faith of those chosen. You don't expect that. That, that seems weird. The faith of the chosen. The, 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 faith, the faith is bigger than any one person. And so what I see going on here is really what, what Don describes, that Paul is, is saying he's laboring such that the chosen would come to faith and then go one step further, live by that faith. Just think of, of the ministry of Paul. What's Paul seeking to do? I mean, uh, we, we, we just were in the morning series, we're in Acts chapter 20, and, and what does Paul say right up front? He's, he's preaching, what, repentance and faith. Trying to, he's, he's, he's proclaiming so that people would come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that seems to be his focus. Yes, go ahead, sister. I saw your hand up. Um, could Paul have written it this way and said, Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ for the benefit of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth which is according to God. For the benefit. And so you, 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 you're translating faith as benefit? Yes. Uh, probably if, if he... If he that could still fit into what Don and I are saying. Yeah. Uh, although b benefit is very broad, right? I mean, it, it, could be, it could be both bringing them to salvation and then how they lived once they're saved, much like what Donna and I are saying. So what, 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 what we're arguing is that, is that Paul is, is, a, is a slave and, and, a, and an apostle for the bringing to faith of the elect and they're living by faith once they're, once they're saved. That, that's his mission. Uh, I think that that's more specific than the benefit, but, but, but that's, a, that's an interesting way of, 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 of looking at it, the, the benefit of, 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 of the chosen. I think that, that what Don and I are saying could fit into that, the, the, uh, the, uh, the benefit, obviously, it would benefit, it benefits the elect to come to faith, obviously, because that's why they're chosen, and then it benefits them to live by that faith. And so, uh, in a general sense, I could I could see that. I don't think that's necessarily wrong, but I don't think that's the point here. Yes, go ahead. The, the question in passing, if, if Paul knew those who, uh, no, I think it said that, could he be addressing those who were chosen before they even got saved? And I was just thinking since this conversation is going in this direction, if you are proclaiming the gospel, when you're proclaiming the gospel, you don't know who has been chosen, and you have to address those that, as if there are some amongst the congregation who are chosen. Exactly. You don't know if someone is chosen, but you know that somebody could be chosen. In that way, because you don't know how God is going to work, and you can't limit what God is going to work. Let me, let me, let's, 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 let's stay on this subject a little bit. Let, let, me, let, me, let me throw something out here and let's, let's, let's talk about this. What does this tell you? Paul, Paul here links faith and being chosen. What does that tell you about those two concepts? So it, it, I'm not sure how you're looking at faith, but I think... Well, just as, just as you and I define it as, as, as coming to Christ and then living by it. Right. And, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because some people say to us, Brother Don, well, if you, if you believe in election, then why even evangelize? 
right? I mean, I mean, I mean why, 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 why present the gospel? People are saved, they're going to be saved. You still have to respond. You still have to respond. You still have to respond. What does this passage tell you about faith and the, and the, and the, the idea of faith and the idea of chosen? Are, are, are they contradictory to each other? No, faith, faith is, a, is, a, is a part of the equation of. Go ahead, say it again. Faith is what? I like that. Faith is part of the equ equation of being chosen by God. Did you hear what you said? Faith is part of the equation. This, this text does not present to us the idea that faith and being chosen is somehow contradictory. In fact, it's, just, it's part of the equation. The, the chosen have to come to faith, right? I mean, that, that seems to be Paul's point here in this text. Paul, Paul is a slave and an apostle for the purpose of bringing the chosen to faith and then having those individuals live by that faith. And so I don't see any contradictory here. I don't see any contradiction. Uh, all those who uh, were elected or chosen believed. That's what, Luke, that's what Acts said, right? Yes. And so what we see here, I don't know if, if, you, if you, you know, sometimes we read over these texts and we don't kind of stop and what are the implications here? But people who try to demonstrate to us that faith that the idea that, 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 that the chosen have to respond is contradictory, don't understand a passage like this. I would go one step further, because I've heard, I've heard that it said also that, that faith and th that these two concepts are in tension with each other. There's a, there's a tension. I don't see a tension here in the text. In fact, as our dear sister said, it's, it's, it seems to be part of part and parcel what was the word again you sister part, it seems to be part and parcel of the equation yes go ahead mm -hmm. just as the believer is called to express faith the preacher or in Paul's case being sent by the Lord he's also called to preach the gospel. We are called to preach the gospel. Which demands faith, does it not? Right. right. We're, we're, we are called to demand faith of people. Right. If faith in the Bible, remember Mark 1, verse 15. Repent and believe the gospel. Those are both commandments. We're commanding people to believe. Now, let me, let me throw a wrench into this just, just, just a little bit. Does this contradict our idea that faith is a gift? You, 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 would, you would just look at that up, weren't you? Just trying, to, just trying to think through that. Yeah, because uh, it, I've heard it say even the faith, and I was looking at 2 Timothy uh, 2.25, that uh, we have to have, even God has to give us the faith to believe. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, mm -hmm. he's chosen us, and then he has to give us someone else. So... They don't come to each other. Right, right. This is, the way, this is the way I framed it. Let me, let me see what y'all think about this. I said this. That, that the faith they exercise is a gift in no way contradicts the fact that sinners are called to exercise it and that only the chosen are empowered to do so. See, faith, as our brother shared, is a command. It's an imperative. We're not, we're not indicating by commanding people that they can do it. What's the command holding, holding forth? It's holding forth the requirement of God. What does God require? That's what the command says. It's not what man is able to give. It's what does God require? 
And so we, we beckon to men to repent and believe in the gospel. That, that, that's what we beckon for them to do. We call them to do that. That's God's requirement. That God has to give them the faith to believe has nothing to do with that. It's what is the expectation of God? And then God empowers those he's chosen to exercise the faith that he then gives. You are salvation, yeah. not man centric. Yes. Yeah. Because we, we know what God has promised and what God does. And but but I think around us it's prevalent for people to think what man does in terms of salvation and forget about God's part and his role. Oh salvation, yeah, yeah. Salvation of God is from the Old Testament all all throughout. It's of God. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I grew up in a I grew up in a in a man centered expression of Christianity. And so I, I know very well that, that the things we're saying this evening wouldn't play very well there. But, but it's clear that this is what Scripture, that's, this is what scripture teaches. The, the, that here in this text, Paul has no problem talking about the chosen coming to faith and then living by that faith. And he saw himself, he saw that as a critical part of his ministry, yes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's impossible for the chosen not to come to faith. Yes, it's, it's impossible for the chosen not to come to faith. Yes. They will come, they will come to faith at some point. Right. But until that point, they are as resistant and as obstinate as those who are not chosen. There's, there's nothing special about the chosen until they're converted. Go back and look at your, your life <laughs> yeah. before Christ. Yeah, just look at, just look in the mirror and you know that's you know, the true statement, right? You would know. Yeah. You know, I, I, uh, I recall Hank Hennegraaff saying, you know, he, he was against Calvinism. And his father was, a, I think he said his father was a Calvinist and he was against it because he, he looked at Calvinism as God pre-wiring people. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. <laughs> in a way, you know, mm. God already pre-wired your soul. I mean, you're going to, mm -hmm. you, you, you're going to get saved. You're going to be saved because mm -hmm. He's already pre as though there is no will of the person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And that's that's a wrong understanding of, of what the Bible's teaching. Yeah. So the ones that are obstinate and do not believe, they will be hell because they are still responsible. Oh yeah. And they will be in hell because of that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So here we see the first subject of his mission was the idea of faith. Faith that, that the elect come to in salvation and then faith that they live by once they're saved. But that wasn't the only thing he was concerned with, not just faith, but also notice the knowledge of the elect. Paul says, the knowledge of the truth which is according to godliness. <clears throat> the phrase, the knowledge of the truth, was used by Paul only in the pastoral epistles. So the only place that Paul, the only place the Bible uses this phrase is in the pastoral letters, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Only place. Although the two terms that make it up were used all over the, all over the, New, the New Testament. So, so, the, so both knowledge and truth obviously are, are, are a a critical part of, of New Testament teaching, but this phraseology is only used here in the pastorals. This is actually, this, this text in Titus is actually the second time the phrase appears in the pastorals. The first time it appears is in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Paul will then use it two more times in 2 Timothy. He'll use it in 2 Timothy 2, verse 25, and 2 Timothy 3, verse 7. The first use of this phrase clearly conveyed the idea of conversion. 
So the first time Paul used this word, he was talking about somebody coming, coming to salvation. L- 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 listen to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. Paul writes, he describes the, the, uh, the father in the following terms. He is the one who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And so there we see the idea of salvation, coming to the knowledge of the truth. Now, let's, let's, let's break this phrase down. The, the uh, term knowledge, epigenosin, is actually a compound word derived from a root term that was important to the New Testament's description of Christianity. The Greeks had more than one term for knowledge. I talked about this in the morning's message. And each of these terms focused upon a, a different characteristic of knowledge. The particular root term with which the, uh, this word that Paul used here was, was formed on emphasizes the knowledge of a thing as it really was. The knowledge of a thing as it really was, and not merely an opinion of it. Okay, it's not the, it's not the opinion, it's the actual knowledge of it as it really was. So uh, we might say that it was the actual perception of a thing as it really was through personal experience. Paul indicated the content of this knowledge being the truth. The truth, the knowledge, the real perception of the truth. In other words, it is what one actually comes to really know. Uh, Obviously, truth is another important term for the Christian faith. The truth, as it is used in the Bible, in the New Testament, refers to various things. uh, Uprightness, sincerity, reality, genuineness, all these are are ways in which the concept of truth is translated or understood. Well, what exactly was, is Paul's emphasis in this text? What does Paul mean when he says that he's, 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 an, he's a slave and an apostle for the faith of those chosen of God and the knowledge of the truth? So what's he referring to here? The knowledge of the truth. The, the, the perception, the real perception, the real understanding of the truth. Well, I can't deal with that thought without what you say, which is according to godliness. So I, in my mind, it's saying <clears throat> the knowing is expressed in living. You're a little ahead of us. You're getting a little ahead of us. Um, so uh, n- real knowledge is expressed in living. I would agree with that. But before we get to that point, what is he, what is he referring to when he says the knowledge of the truth? Of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge. Of the truth. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Let's let's so let, 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 the truth of. So is it is the truth referring to? He's not capital, and I go because Christ says that He is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay. I don't think the exact reference is to John fourteen six. But l- let's kind of stick with what Calvin said. In what sense? are the chosen coming to the knowledge of the truth? In the truth of, um, the truth about Jesus Christ. Okay, so why is that necessary? That's necessary for what purpose? For salvation, right? So knowledge of the truth here could be a reference, since in the context we've already established, he's probably talking about salvation here, right? The the faith of, 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 of the chosen. So this could be a reference to the truths that make up the Christian faith, particularly the gospel, right? Christ, his life, his death, 
his burial and, and resurrection, all those things necessary for a person to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That's one way we can understand the truth here, that, he, he, that he's serving God in order to bring the chosen to a knowledge of the truth, that they would embrace the truth about Christ that brings them to salvation. So in that sense, it would be apprehending the truth. He, he wants them to come to understand the truth. Is that, is that the only way, only idea here, do you think? Do you know people who know the truth but don't live it? Obviously, we all do, right? We struggle with that in our own life, right? If we be honest. But, but sure we do. So the concern of Scripture is not just apprehension, but could I frame it this way? It's also appropriation. You have to understand what the truth is, but is that, is that enough? Has to be appropriated, right? <clears throat> Dr. Knight, in his commentary on Titus, suggests that there is a sense in which the truth must not only be grasped on a, in a theoretical sense that is apprehended, it must also, it must also represent what he refers to as a state of affairs to be actualized. A state of affairs to be actualized. This is tied to the fact that knowing is not just rational comprehension, but acknowledgement. It's acknowledgement, accepting that the situation is as it has been said. It's one thing to hear, you're a sinner, do you accept that to be the case? It's one thing to hear that Jesus can save you. Oh, I don't believe that. You're unwilling to accept that to be the case. So you have to, when it comes to the truth, you have to also accept that the situation is as it has been described to you. You have to both appropriate you have to both apprehend and appropriate the, 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 uh, the uh, truth. You have to, you have to what, do we, what do we mean by uh, that we have to appropriate? We have to embrace it, right? I can throw out a, a, a life boy to a drowning man. What's the only way that that drowning man will, will be saved? If he appropriates it. He could, he could see it there in the water and say, that sure enough is a life boy. <laughs> will, will, will his acceptance of the truth of that be sufficient? He will not be saved until he appropriates it for himself. He's got to take a hold of the life boy. says in uh, chapter 7 he says for Ezra set, had said in his heart to study the law, law of the Lord and to do it and to teach the statutes and rules in Ezra. Mm -hmm. So he put those things in order. He, it's easy saying that I need to know what God's word says. Yeah, Ezra 7, you, that, that's, yeah. a good, that's a good text. And then after I know what it says and understand what it says, I got to do it. Mm -hmm. I got to appropriate it, mm -hmm. if you will. Mm -hmm. And then once I appropriate it, then I'm able to share it with Israel. And, and, this, uh, and this understanding, understanding that we're getting to this evening fits with Don's last phrase he wanted to get to so early in, in, in our discussion. The, 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 the intent The intent of the mission mm. 
according to godliness. According to godliness. This truth, and by inference, faith, that Paul reminded Titus was key to his, to his ministry and service was for the purpose of accomplishing godliness. Godliness. We could also translate this as in keeping with godliness. So <clears throat> this word godly here, what godliness, what, is it, what does this word mean? It's, this is a word uh, that's used, the, the word that we have translated godliness here is only used in the pastoral epistles. So only, it's only used in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Most of its uses, all but two of them, appear in 1 Timothy. And it, it, it referred to the life or conduct produced from an awe or reverence for God. Awe and reverence produces a life that is accurately described as godliness, that is a life lived out by the standard of the one who is reverenced. By reverencing God, you then live as God lives. So this, this truth is that which aligns with God's intended purpose of godliness. This truth here in the text is that which aligns with God's intended purpose of godliness. Now, I'm going to say something that might, kind of, might sound strange at first. Paul's view of truth in this text is rather myopic. It's rather myopic. Why do I say that? Well, Christian apologists tend to have a very broad view of truth. As well, they should. I'm not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but uh, because they're arguing for the validity of Christianity, so they pull in a lot of different things that are true. But not everything that's true leads to godliness. Right? It's true that water is wet. I don't know what type of godly behavior you're going to derive from that. All right? And so, and so uh, Paul is talking about truth here that leads to godliness. Is that truth? Yes, absolutely. The truth. So you're right. He, he, he narrows it. Yeah, the knowledge of the truth. In keeping with godliness. And so Paul here is arguing that his ministry focuses on the chosen coming to faith and living by that faith, and it's also focused on knowledge of the truth, particularly that leads people, the chosen who've been saved, obviously, to live godly lives. Uh, Paul, uh, the, the, listen to Paul's statement in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse, verse 3, where this idea of godliness is, is, used, is used. Listen to what he says here. This is talking about false teachers. If anyone advocates a different doctrine, so, so he's, already, he's, already, he's already narrowed truth down to what? The doctrines of Christianity, right? the teachings of Christianity, the doctrines of, of the faith. So he says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the, here it is, doctrine conforming to godliness. So there is a doctrine that leads to godly behavior. Now, where would we find that doctrine? Where do we, where do we, where do we, where do we locate that doctrine? In the Bible. In the Bible. And so Paul here has given us a very clear understanding of what his mission was. What was he an apostle for? Why did God, why did God set him aside for apostolic work? Well, God had some chosen individuals that he wanted to see come to faith and live by that faith. And how would living by that faith manifest itself? 
it would manifest itself in a growing understanding of the, of the truth of his will and word that would lead them to lives of greater conformity to his own godliness, living and looking like God. And so that was Paul's mission. That was his, that's what, that's what he was designed to accomplish. And that's what we're designed to accomplish. That's part of our mission. That's what we're still doing that mission to, today. Are we not? Is that not the mission of, of, of the church? We want to see the elect saved, right? We want to see the elect living by the faith that saved them. We want to see the elect growing in their knowledge of the truth because as they, as they grow in the knowledge of the truth, what will happen to them? They'll live more godly lives as they grow in the knowledge of the truth fueled by true saving faith. Any questions on what we've seen here this evening, this mission that Paul was on that is also our mission as God's people? We're talking about living according to God, and I'm thinking we're talking about sanctification. And uh, God is the one who controls that, even though we have a part, a human part, God is the one. I'm just thinking about all, all that God is to yeah. the chosen. Yes, yeah, yeah. He's, you know. he, he accomplishes everything in our lives. Yeah, and we, we, we're responding to his work. Yes. He's not responding to ours. And yet, even in our response to him, that's only by grace. Yes, our response is, is a manifestation of grace. God allows us to respond. Yes, very good, excellent. Well, if there's no other questions, if you'd like to take communion and you missed it this morning, you may come forward at this time.